uh, should they want to speak. Um, and, but it's very important while we're doing this that everybody understands, regardless of what anyone's position is, pro or con, it's important that we have a nice clean record. Uh, there could be, after it's all over and done with, somebody might want to uh, oppose a decision or um, maybe they're actually in favor of a decision but want to make sure that the decision is protected. So it's really important that we not be talking over. Um, for people that want to speak, there are forms back there that filling out and we're limiting people to a three minute time, time limit. There have been many, many, many uh, letters, emails, petitions, um, pro and con. All of those have been received. They are part of the official record. Uh, and they've all, every, count, every commission member has been copied on those. The city council have all been copied on those. So all of that is part of the record. So the only other comment, anyone that wants to speak, we're going, you know, you have to fill out the form, but they will, we will allow them to speak. But some of you I know, uh, maybe there may be a group in some cases of people that are all here that have the same position. Rather than have 10 people get up and all say the same thing, if you're here with friends and neighbors and a group and you want to appoint a spokesman that says, I represent the following 10 people or however many it is, for the record, that's fine as well. Uh, because we we're going to have a long, long agenda tonight. Uh, for the benefit of uh, Commissioner Lawrence, we're not officially starting yet. I'm using this time just to kind of give everybody a chance to. We're working on the electronics for the Zoom for the Zoom people. So anyway, I just wanted to wanted to go over that initially, uh, so we don't have any issues when when it comes time to call for people to speak. I will call them out. Uh, they will come up to the podium. They need to give their, you know, their name and their address. And once they have done that, they will they'll be entitled to their three minutes. And I'm going to try to hold people to that because there's a lot of there was a lot of written material. So there may be again be people that don't want, you know, maybe don't want to speak in public, but I wanted to assure everybody that if they send anything in writing in, that is part of our record. So looking to the back, how are we, how are we doing on this electronic? Okay. 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 Just let me know. Okay. They're still having difficulties. They're going to do some additional testing. So at this point, we will we'll we'll wait until we get the get the word. Uh, hopefully, that will be that will be soon. Uh, but we may be here for a few minutes. All right. Thank you all. a lot of times I know there's three people yeah. for sure and there's only one before that I'm so grateful I can trust the person. Yeah. Yeah. I, so. I think I just did it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. And then maybe somebody else should be doing that because I'll be. I'm hard-wired because it was only two megabytes a second. Um, the lady over there knows that. Like, it's actually there's no other. It's just a guess and there's no password. Sorry. Very nice. If you want the fast one, you can He goes home tomorrow. We have two maps. One parent, the other parent. He's four way from Jones. Doesn't matter. He's tolerated in the dark. He's totally a friend. He's not a friend. He's just a friend. Uh, the other one moved out into the back. Actually, why? No, it's a lot easier. Test. Hey Terry, I'm just trying to see if we're going to get a feedback loop. Were you able to hear me, Jason? I have a Bluetooth conference speaker over here, but I haven't, but I can sit over there. It's been a bit from the bottom of my head, so. Hey, Terry, if you can say test, test again, that would be great. Test, test. Can everyone hear Terry's test test? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. We're improvising here, obviously. We thank you for your patience. The wonderful world of technology and hybrid meetings. Jason, if you could if you could test our other PNZ members, make sure we can hear them as well, please. Yes, uh, Commissioner Barry, please, if you could uh, respond. You're muted, sir. Um, we can also have Commissioner Michael Faith test, if you don't mind, please, if you can unmute. I see you're muted. I can hear you, but barely. Okay, I can speak up and project my voice if that's one. We can hear you in the uh, in the auditorium, so that's great. Uh, Commissioner Bob Berry, do you mind confirming that you can hear us and that um, if you could speak so that we can see if we can hear you? Yeah, I hear you. you like uh, Mike said, uh, you're very faint. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Derry. Could everyone hear Mr. Dare and Mr. Faith? Thank you. Dan and Jason, good to go. Mr. Chairman, whenever you're ready, sir. Before we before we start, can you just for the audience uh, tell us who of the are on Zoom right now? Certainly, thank you, uh, Chair, members of the public, and other commissioners and applicants. Uh, we have. Commissioner Lawrence, Chairman uh, Ledger, Commissioner uh, Alby, 
and uh, Commissioner Frazier and uh, personal attendance here at the meeting. On Zoom, we have Commissioner Faith and Commissioner uh, Barry. Okay, thank you. And we also have Commissioner O'Connor, but for only items A, B, and C, will be recused for item D. Right, and then, yeah, it's actually D. Let's see, it's, it's all D, E, and F, right? Oh, D, E, and F, thank you. Okay. All right, at this point, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. And if you would, if you would, would everyone please join us with the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, our first item of business is on our agenda is 3A, the City Center Zoning District Text Amendment. Uh, Jason Sanks, would you please give us a presentation? Uh, thank you, Chair, Commissioners, members of the public and city staff. Um, the uh, Litchfield Square project, as everyone knows quite well, has taken off in regards to infrastructure improvements, the city park, and, um, and other developments in regards to perhaps lot three. Uh, that went to the design board last week. Um, through the course of uh, ongoing development and consideration of future projects in Litchfield Square, um, we've identified a, a need for a possible text amendment to the zoning code for that zoning district. Um, and that's specifically in regards to a, a couple of sensitive uses that are required to be separated from one another when adjacent to a facility that has, for example, a bar license. Um, so just to recap what the city center district, its purpose is, and it, it, the district is to promote pedestrian oriented commercial and civic core activities that include ground level retail shops and restaurants, government and professional offices, public parks and plazas. Um, while working on the multiple private developments that would occur in Litchfield Square, We've noted concerns of separation of land uses as required through liquor licensing and other sorts of things like a liquor license for a bar, for example, would require it to be separated from a church by about 300 feet or from a school or other sensitive land uses. So there was consideration of, do we need to consider, do we delete or modify the, the permitted use of a religious institution or a school in the city center? Or can perhaps as in, noted in item number four, uh, we're going down the road of exploring the option of doing an entertainment district over the city center, which would then uh, suspend the rules for separation of sensitive land uses, for example, from a bar so that we could have a mixed use downtown where you have bars and restaurants and churches and schools all in close proximity to one another. Further, um, our current code um, developed the definition for what's called a smoke lounge many years ago, and that's before the um, introduction of things like vape shops and CBD sales, medical and recreational marijuana, hookah bars, things like that, that have uh, become uh, popular in, in some parts of the community. Um, there's been an intent to redefine smoke lounge more specifically and to actually preclude some of the uses that would currently be under smoke lounge and separately define them and separately exclude them from city center. That would include, like I said, hookah bars, CBD or cannabis oil sales as a primary use vape shops and uh, clarify that recreational and medical marijuana sales um, are, are not allowed in city center. They're already prohibited, but this would be to clarify that. And this is the, uh, the redefinition or the definition revised for smoke lounge that we would introduce. As the chair already outlined, we're basically introducing this concept of a text amendment to the PNZ tonight. It will be brought back to PNZ on a future hearing data as what we call a citizen review item which means it will be publicly noticed and we'll be able to receive public comment and interact with the public on their concerns regarding said text amendment. Uh, in other words, we're handing this over for them to them in advance as a courtesy for preliminary review. Thank you, Mr. Sanks. Do any members of the commission have any questions for Mr. Sanks? Okay, hearing none. Let's move on to item 3B, 
Major General Plan Amendment, 15 acres located at the northwest corner of West Wigwam Boulevard and North Richville Road. And again, this item is on only for information. We're not going to be voting tonight on that. Mr. Thank you, Sanders, Chair. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners, members of the public. As already introduced by the Chair, this is a request for a major general plan amendment for the 15 acres, the currently undeveloped 15 acres at the northwest corner of Wigwam and Litchfield Road. Uh, it's on the opposite west side of the street from the new Litchfield Square project, and I have a brief PowerPoint. So this application is um, privately initiated by uh, representatives, legal counsel for IDM, not to be confused with JDM, who's the owner. IDM is the prospective developer of the majority of the property, and they're seeking a text amendment to the general plan. Back in 2014, a specific language was negotiated for that 15 acre commercial parcel to allow um, some residential development to occur there in a mixed use format where you'd have kind of that downtown residential over uh, commercial development and a minimum 75,000 square feet of commercial was um, outlined to be retained for development on that parcel so that the city would retain the commercial development while still allowing some residential. Uh, the applicant has requested um, that they edit that language. There's the subject property there across from Litchfield Square, prominent piece in the as a gateway to the city. Um, they, are, um, they initially came to us in 2019 looking to strike the requirement for requ any requirement for any commercial development on the property. The intention would be to untether themselves from the requirement while still likely providing some commercial. Um, at that time, and as currently proposed, our understanding is that they are, would like to develop a multifamily apartment style project with amenities and a much smaller level of commercial than currently required by the general plan. Um, I won't necessarily read all this through. I, it's hard to read for those of you that are looking at the screen, but more or less, they're looking to strike the 75,000 square foot minimum of commercial development. And they're also looking to strike any timing requirements that residential development on the property uh, precede or advance concurrently with the commercial. The intention uh, was to preclude residential from happening and not getting the commercial, if, unless I said that backwards. The idea was that we would get the commercial development and not just get uh, residential. Um, it's always been the intent of that corner to have commercial, at least since um, it's been zoned that way for many years. But this will again be brought back uh, through what's called the major general plan amendment process. That schedule was adopted by the city council in January of this year. We do it annually. And so to give you an idea of the mapping on this parcel, if you're interested in keeping uh, track of its progress, uh, clearly tonight's the study session intro where we do a courtesy intro to PNZ and the public. It also kicks off what we call a 60 day agency review. So we distribute to partner agencies and adjacent jurisdictions starting today. Uh, that goes out and after 60 days we get their comments. Um, between the month of August and September 3rd, the applicant um, will hold what's called a citizen review meeting uh, and invite neighbors uh, surrounding the property to participate in their, uh, their presentation and what they wanna do with the property. We anticipate that that citizen review meeting will also include a zoning case that's forthcoming. And we've been advised that a zoning case will come in that'll detail what this project would look like, what type of housing units and all of those types of details that would be introduced at the end of this month. We don't currently have that application on file at the city yet. This item would be brought back to this same uh, commission on September 13th as another study session item and citizen review comments would be reviewed, at which time the public, all of you here or anybody else that's interested, could converse and have a dialogue with the commission and staff in regards to the concerns about the proposal. Lastly, in October, it's expected that the PNC would actually take, this commission would take action on the item in terms of a recommendation to the city council, whether they support or don't support it. And then council would take action uh, prospectively in November and then possibly December of this year based on that schedule. So again, it's for introduction only. Uh, if you have to answer questions. Do any of the uh, commission members have any questions for Mr. Sanks concerning item B? Yes, go ahead. Do we have any idea how much square footage they want to use for commercial now? since they're cutting it down. Now, through the chair, Commissioner Alvey, um, th thank you for that. Um, there, 
Major General Plan Amendment requests us to strike entirely the 75,000 square foot requirement and not specify a minimum amount. In prior conversations dating back to 2019 until this past April, we've seen something in the range of about 14,000, 13,000 square feet proposed. So are they anticipating putting up an apartment complex there or housing, or do they have a plan? And if so, how many apartments? Um, Commissioner Albee, great question. That would be included in the zoning case. Uh, we understand loosely and within the, the confines of what we can discuss here tonight based on the way the agenda is written, just loosely speaking, it's been mentioned uh, two-story apartments with garages and carports and uh, with resort style, like kind of a clubhouse and pool in the middle. Yeah, thank you. Um, and in the staff report presented, and for those that are attending and know how to access the staff report online, um, the website for the developer who is the applicant um, is liveidm.com if you want to see their other projects. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Lawrence. Oh. I did go to the website and I saw that they have some attractive apartment buildings and some that are just big and boxy. And I didn't know if uh, for the next meeting that quickly, if they would have a rendering, some elevations, an idea where the retail would be in that. Um, I'm a visual person. And I'd love to see a little bit more about their plans. And thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, Commissioner Lawrence, yes, as part of the forthcoming zoning application that would come in at the end of the month, by the time it comes back to this commission, it would include a site plan, landscape plan, and building elevation so you can see visually what the project is intended to look like. Are there any other questions? Okay, hearing none, let's, let's move on to agenda item 3C. Introduction of Zoning Code Section 31.04, Screening of Non-Principal Uses Text Amendment. Go ahead, Mr. Sun. Thank you, Chair, Commissioners and Public again. This third item is uh, yet again another text amendment. Um, this is um, initiated at the behest of council. Uh, generally, um, when the city initiates a text amendment, it's at the request of council where they direct PNZ and staff to uh, use resources to explore um, things such as um, amending our code, if in this case, um, a concern for section 31.04, which covers the screening of non-principal uses. And in layman's terms for everyone here, what that means is how do we screen items such as recreational vehicles, boats, uh, trailers, and other pieces of mobile equipment on residential lots. Um, in the last 18 months, um, this text amendment originated with a kind of a neighbor complaint that an RV was visible in, in violation of the zoning ordinance. Over the course of 18 months, between that being reported to the city, code enforcement, there was an interpretation done of the code um, and ultimately presented to the Board of Adjustment uh, that a very direct reading of the code suggests that all RVs, boats, and um, trailers or the like would need, must be completely screened, means not visible whatsoever from adjoining properties or a public street, and must be set back from the property line um, based upon a, a measured height from natural grade, and the setback is kind of a sliding scale measured against natural grade. Uh, this ultimately came back before council at the time that they asked us to initiate this review, and that was um, to kind of revisit the city's position on, on what, how we want to, as a city, regulate the screening and setbacks of these sorts of pieces of equipment. And there certainly are positions on both sides of it. Again, this is just introduction tonight. We'll be bringing this back either next month or in September as a citizen review item after it's been publicly noticed. Um, at the meeting with the council, we were advised to consider different options. Um, and so without specific language um, provided to us by the council members, rather it was just a broad instruction to revisit this. You know, what do, where do we wanna go with this? Item, like the first approach that staff took was to really strengthen the language of the code because there was perceived ambiguity as to what completely screen meant. And the Board of Adjustment found that completely screen, screen means completely screen. For some people thought, well, that's not possible. You know, it's almost impossible to screen RV completely. Someone's gonna see it. Well, item number one that you'll see up here was that we were asked to, or we developed language that strengthens that code to reinforce completely screened. 
And our understanding is the intent of council many years ago was that they didn't really want large recreational vehicles stored on, on residential lots. They preferred them to be stored off site and, and, and RV storage facilities. Same goes with boats and other large pieces of equipment. The second option was to look at perhaps completely screening RVs, but allow them to be somewhat closer to the property line than currently allowed. Uh, right now, as the code reads, they would need significant setbacks from the property line and be generally screened by what I call the oleander hedge treatment, where you'd have a giant oleander hedge that could possibly be the landscape that would screen those vehicles. And lastly, uh, we prepared language that reflects more the intent of the initial zoning administrator interpretation of the code, which would allow partial visibility of recreational vehicles or boats, and also allow them to be set back somewhat closer to the property line. So in the uh, commissioner packets and is available online for anybody in the public that would like to review the in very initial draft language for intro tonight, uh, we've done a legislative edit of the current code, which is how we do text amendments, and then recapped and read below um, the gist of what it, what it accomplishes. So item one would ensure that everything is continued to be completely screened and set back a minimum of two feet for every foot of height of an RV. So if you have a 12 foot RV, tall RV, it would be required to be set back from a site or rear property line by 24 feet. And you'd have to have some pretty substantial landscaping to screen it. That's what this code language would do is strengthen that position, which is the current position of the Board of Adjustment. If the public felt that that was too onerous of a requirement for owners of, of that sort of equipment that want to keep those items on their residential lots, um, a proposed draft that would somewhat change this would require the screening to remain in place, but allow the equipment to be set back somewhat closer to the property line, um, a minimum of five feet uh, from the property line, and then an additional foot of setback from the side or rear for every additional foot of height over um, uh, 10 feet. So this would be a somewhat compromised solution if you're someone on the fence, no pun intended, but if you're on the other side of the fence, uh, that you're okay with it being close to the property line so long as you still can't see it. That would be the intent of where this text would take it. Now for those in the community that don't have a problem with recreational vehicles parked on, on their lots and they, and they believe that a six foot wall is enough screening for a 10 foot tall RV, um, this would be the language that would be prepared to address their interest. Um, you know, again, staff doesn't have a position on any three of these quite yet. These have just been prepared for introduction to PNZ. So if you have an interest, please do uh, provide feedback and participate in the process as we go into citizen review next month. Ultimately, staff seeks public input through citizen review for the text amendment process. And really, you know, what does the community want to be? Um, how do you want your residential properties to look, be maintained, and how do you want to accommodate the storage and screening of these types of vehicles and equipment? I'd be happy to answer questions. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Sanks? Yes, go ahead. Um, one of my pet peeves, both as a resident as well as a real estate agent, is that a lot of times people will Agents will post properties for sale in Litchfield Park stating that there's no HOA. And the old part of it, Litchfield Park does not have an HOA. However, other newer communities within our city do. Um, one of my big issues is that I don't feel that we should necessarily have a lower standard of quality on our residential properties by having RVs on those properties. Um, in addition to that, and looking at version one, I was wondering if Mr. Sanks, if we could divide up that sentence that talks about the landscaping as well as the height and make the landscaping a separate statement altogether. Because if you have dense landscaping, there's absolutely no limit on how that can, how high that can go. Whereas fences within Litchfield Park that cannot be higher than six feet. Um, in addition to that, I know that when the city council recommended that this come back to planning and zoning for um, review and to tighten up the, the wording of this. They mentioned that the entire code, uh, or the zoning code 31.04A parts both one and two be reevaluated. And I know that in what's been presented here tonight, we've covered section one, but we have not discussed section two at all, which it, it, it appears when I read this, it seems as though whoever wrote this was trying to be very positive 
with what they said and not be as exclusionary. And that I think just muddied the waters and made everything very confusing for everyone. Um, but part two deals with um, the same types of vehicles, suburbans, vans, RVs, pickup trucks, all of that, um, essentially stating that they can be parked in a driveway as opposed to being more specific in saying that they should not be parked along sidewalls or in backyards. And I was hoping that we could maybe tighten that up as well, since that was also a recommendation from the city council. Thank you to the chair, Commissioner Albee. Yes, staff will be um, visiting item number two for prospective revisions, and that will be introduced through the citizen review process uh, when we bring it back to you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Sanks? Okay, well, let's, let's move on then to uh, item item D, uh, and at this point, uh, Brian Connor has has announced that he would recuse himself, so he will be taken out of the waiting room. He's waving goodbye. I see. Um, but moving on, this is a public hearing. Uh, people will be allowed to allowed to speak, and I will at this time ask for Jason Sanks. Uh, to give us the staff report. And thank you, Chair, Commissioners, members of the public, and I believe most of the people here tonight, thank you for taking the time out to attend and participate in this. This is how we drive direction on, on projects and, and as part of the overall evaluation of the requests. Uh, this project, I'm going to go ahead and start a PowerPoint presentation also online and with the Commissioner packets. And for some of you that know where to check online as a staff report, that goes into somewhat greater detail of what we would recap in a PowerPoint, but I'll try to cover all the bases tonight. So the project known as the Thomas is the Vistago at the Centro um, Church property that's located at Villanueva and Old Litchfield Road. Um, that project, I, I, I believe almost everybody here knows exactly where it's located, but I'll get to a site map here in a moment. Um, that project has been uh, initiated for a, a request has been submitted to the city of Litchfield Park by a private entity, a private developer uh, at the uh, with ownership authorization from the church that owns the property. Now, uh, the church is looking to sell that property um, for a partnership and private development. And that's what is currently pending review with the city and currently before you tonight as a public hearing item. Um, progress to date in terms of meetings. I'm going to share my screen and you can follow along. So the neighborhood meeting, I believe many of you were able to attend that. Some were maybe not aware of it at the time. Um, the citizen review meeting, also known as the neighborhood meeting, was held on May 17th. It was well attended. There were 80 plus attendees plus the applicant team and city staff, as well as, well as members of the council to kind of uh, witness the comments back and forth between both the applicant developer and members of the public and neighbors. Uh, after that, last month on June 14th, we did, as we did earlier tonight on the agenda, courtesy introduction of the project at PNZ, in which case we didn't have much dialogue back and forth on the project, but rather since the project was in the public realm, we did a courtesy introduction to the commission so that they would have all of the exhibits that the public had already seen. And we subsequently posted those on the city's website to facilitate citizen review. The always the intent with citizen review is to be transparent, get the applicants private development submitted items out to the public so that the public has a chance to look at it. So that's what we've done. Um, and so we introduced the project on June 14th. One second as I toggle slides. Um, this is an aerial context view of the site. You can see the church site is there and the kind of the orange yellow highlight. And you can see the context of, you know, your neighborhood around it. You can see the there's five homes that back to the site on the east. There's the town and community, of course, on the uh, north side with Tierra Verde Lake Park. Uh, there's the maintenance facility and another church, of course, on the west side of Old Litchfield Road. And to the south is, of course, Indian School uh, and in the city of Goodyear. Specifically, the requests are two. One is a minor general plan amendment. Uh, when changing the land use from public facility to commercial or requesting such, you would need to uh, request a minor general plan amendment. Since the time of the initial application, um, 
there had been significant concern about the loss of prospective church, the church on the property, and perhaps as well the congregation that's already in the church. Um, the applicant resubmitted uh, since the citizen review meeting and have chosen to leave the church assembly hall and chapel as public facility and not request a minor general plan amendment for the church. Subsequently, there's a companion rezoning case that's where you start to see more details of the prospective development. Uh, this is a change in zoning district classification from public facility to neighborhood commercial, uh, which is a limited commercial zoning district um, for the majority of the property. Um, again, uh, initially, David Commercial was proposed for the whole property. The applicant revised their application, resubmitted, and excerpted out or accepted out the, the church assembly hall and chapel. And then there's a proposed what's called a planned development overlay across the entire site. And the planned development overlay, as we'll get into a little bit later, and if you've read in the staff report, is a tool, a zoning tool that's used to um, open the box, if you will, and impose additional restrictions on the project or seek relief from certain development standards. You can restrict uses with it. If there's a number of uses that you don't think would be compatible with the neighborhood, you could restrict those out. Um, and then you could also do things like uh, attach what's called a, the site plan, which is in this case, almost identical to the aerial since the intention is to uh, preserve all of the existing site buildings and repurpose some of them for office and retail and restaurant cafe. Um, the plan development uh, tool can would be imposed as requested by the applicant and encouraged by the city, at least in this request, to ensure that this site could not be basically demolished and rebuilt with something completely different. As requested now, if the project were to be rezoned as requested, uh, they would not be able to eliminate or demolish any of the structures on the site, but rather just repurpose what's there. Uh, Many of you have already read the applicant's narrative and attended the neighborhood meeting. Um, what they presented to us in this context is that this is a, what they call an adaptive reuse of the existing religious facility, and that includes the site buildings. Vestago Epicenter of Phoenix, creating a lifestyle destination at a neighborhood scale as stated in the application. Um, currently within between the church buildings, of course, there's walkways and some landscaping. The intention would they've envisioned would be to en enhance those areas with seating uh, some dining options near the current rectory for the cafe and beautify the site so that it becomes kind of an indoor outdoor interactive environment. Since the time of the initial application, some clarity has come to the applicant and their negotiations with the current owner. Um, the ownership has been trying to sell the property. The church identifies the property as an asset that's privately owned by the church and its own public facility, which includes any a number of allowable uses. It's not just zoned for church, um, but it's currently has a church on it. So they've looked, as, they've looked to sell the property since 2021. And as we understand that initially entered into negotiations with another church to acquire it. And as I understand from the pastor, those negotiations uh, broke down. And then they entered into negotiations with the current applicant, Mr. O'Connor and TriWest Realty uh, to do uh, a redevelopment. Now that initial redevelopment was to turn the assembly hall and the chapel into prospective community theater, if you will, or some sort of a mixed use assembly hall. Um, that has been updated. And as of more recently, the applicant has worked out a deal with Vistago to not only keep all of the buildings in place, but also to enter into a five year lease back agreement where the church could sell the asset as I understand they, they need to sell for, and I'll let them speak for themselves for financial purposes, but that they would be able to lease back the property and continue their congregation services on site for five years. Um, and those terms would be between uh, the developer and the church. The city doesn't review those terms, but we're aware that they have that agreement. So that's the that's the change since the neighborhood meeting for anybody that didn't already know was that the church intends to now stay on site. Um, the rectory and the existing uh, offices associated with the church would also be stay on site, but the applicant is seeking to redevelop the rectory as a cafe or perhaps a, a light service restaurant. The church offices would be repurposed as professional offices, which means they wouldn't have to be directly tied to the activities of the church, but rather it could be like a title company or a law firm or something like that, or even perhaps some, as they call it, boutique retail, which is another word of saying smaller retail or small stores rather than large stores. Um, that's the current application that we have. So I wanted to give everyone here an update in case you hadn't already read that. The illustrative site plan that's been submitted, which would be tied to any perspective, if 
there were to be an approval on this project, it would be directly tied to this. This site plan is an illustrative rendering of almost exactly what's out there. The only thing that's different than what's out there would be the enhancements to the green areas and the seating that you see here in the paving. But almost the entire site would be the same. It would just be remodeled. Um, and then there's a proposed future phase um, uh, located to the south of the existing church office building. You can see these buildings here uh, kind of in this kind of a pink highlight where my mouse is hovering. Those are, that is a prospective future phase of what's likely going to be office. It doesn't have any frontage on or visibility from either of the roadways. So we would anticipate that would probably be professional office. The applicant submitted to the city and to the public for review some conceptual renderings of how they may wish to remodel the site. Uh, our understanding is it's been designed to enhance and support uh, also support and complement city center development, which as you know, is further down the oldest road to the north. Um, they have a low capacity community theater that could be an option for when the church isn't using the facility for religious services. And of course the church has their own activities there. And then also it would support small businesses for their application. And you can see uh, these illustrative exhibits of how they would uh, remodel the property if, if this zoning case were successful. So as you can imagine, this is a lot of um, a lot to a lot to ponder when the city looks at this, and especially with the amount of public input coming in, and how the project was presented as a commercial rezone. Is it still going to be a church or not be a church? What what's really going to happen here? We had a lot of angles in which to approach this. So only uh, just as recently as July seventh, the city received confirmation that the Fostago congregation would remain on site, rather than sell the property and move away and perhaps lease or buy somewhere else or merge with another congregation. So our understanding is they have a five-year uh, perspective lease back agreement with the applicant. Um, on July 11th, we also received a letter directly from the property owner, uh, senior pastor Roberto, uh, Roberto Romero, um, asking for uh, the public and the city to support its efforts to remain a viable congregation on site. Um, they state in the letter uh, that with the support of the community, if the sale of the property were to go through, whereas portions of the property, such as the existing office and rectory could be redeveloped as stated in the application of, as you've been presented, um, that would allow them to stay solvent and, and stay in the property and continue or even expand congregation services for the next five years or perhaps beyond. Um, it's our understanding that if the um, sale of the property, whether through this application or with this applicant or others is not successful, they will um, still look to sell the property, but it's not certain if they would remain on site or if they would simply sell and move away. So this, this is just as of July 11th, so yesterday. So we're working in real time with uh, the fluid project and uh, we wanted to present that the latest to you. Um, as of the writing of the staff report, you know, as staff repairs are recommendations and evaluations, we have to do so in advance so they can be properly packaged and posted on the website, distributed to the public and members of the commission. Um, we received on Friday later in the day a number of signed petitions in, in opposition to the project. And so those were swept into the packet at the very last minute, I believe, which indicated a significant number or members of the community in opposition to the uh, prospective commercial rezoning or commercial uses on the site. Um, we are not certain at the staff level based on some of the input received. Some of it was, you know, some of you were very careful and methodical in all of your reasoning points. So we can really clearly see the direction from which we're coming from, whether you supported it or you didn't, or you're wavering or, or not, but we weren't certain if everybody knew that the intention was to keep all of the buildings on site and not bulldoze it, start with something new. We also weren't certain if the public was aware that the applicant had worked out what they perceive as a compromise solution with the church to stay on site and protect the church, the chapel, the assembly hall, and keep the congregation there for five years. So that's one thing that we wanted to do tonight was express that to you in case that in any way influences your perception of the project. Um, and lastly, I wanted to clarify, the city wants to clarify that um, the property is currently, it's not zoned residential and it's not zoned commercial, it's zoned public facility. Um, so that means right now the current use of the property is a church, a rectory, and offices associated with the church. The church, by its own definition, can have a number of accessory uses, and many of you may be parts of congregation as uh, my family is where you have 
churches that have coffee shops and, and even have dining services. You can order pizza and they have uh, events um, and they even have gift shops, bookstores and those sorts of things. So larger congregations and larger religious facilities have those, but those are allowed as part of the church as what we consider accessory. The applicant is proposing to disassociate the requirement that those sorts of things be directly, you know, associated with the church, but would operate independently. So for example, a sandwich shop is what they're looking at or a cafe, or when they say restaurant, the idea is something small like a cafe or professional offices like a law firm rather than the actual offices of the church be located there. Um, they've, that's what we've been presented with. So I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that if the property were to sell and redevelop, um, just be cognizant of the fact that the potential buyer, if successful, if they wanted to keep the rezoning or the zoning as public facility, <laughs> there are other uses out there for you all to contemplate that you may find more palatable or may not. Those could include uh, child care, daycare centers, uh, continuum of care facilities, like with uh, residents and medical facilities for uh, senior living. Um, they could include schools and, uh, of course, other churches. There's other uses as well allowed, but I wanted you to know that it could redevelop as those other uses. Those other uses are not what's proposed. What's proposed is what you've seen at the citizen review in tonight's presentation. Those are the, these are the uses I just uh, mentioned that could be allowed on the property if the public facility zoning stays. And these are the uses that are, are primarily proposed by the applicant. Um, retention of the religious facilities, professional offices, retail, and then a restaurant cafe. Uh, since the neighborhood meeting, the applicant has sought to provide uh, restrictions uh, to address concerns of the community as to what type of uses could occur there. I think the applicant noted that there was a concern like a pet boys or something could be built on the site and that someone was going to bulldoze the church. Um, the, the, that would not be possible with this application of uh, the self-imposed restrictions to actually preclude that from being possible legally if this zoning case were to be successful. For their car rentals, convenience stores, equipment rental, hookah bars, mini warehouses, supermarkets, vehicle repair and storage, all of those would be specifically um, prohibited. One item that's not noted that p and may wish to consider is that bars, taverns, and cocktail lounges are possible in neighborhood commercial. And there's not an intent to put one in, but with a religious facility there, they wouldn't be able to legally obtain a liquor license because of the separation requirements. Uh, between uh, the land use of a bar and a liquor license and a religious facility. Um, if the, the applicant, as I understand, has no intention of opening a bar, and if, if the neighbors would like that to be added as a prohibited use, I'd been inclined, I understand that they would be open to adding that, but their concern would be that nobody was confused that if the cafe were to serve, for example, mimosas or something, that that wasn't considered a bar, but rather a restaurant that served drinks similar to like Park Cafe and, and further down Old Litchfield Road, that that's the envisioned use. So they'd be willing to add pro uh, prohibit bars as a primary use, but so long as the cafe could perhaps still have uh, some sales of those sorts of drinks. I wanted to explain to everyone here too, and I don't want to be a planning nerd, uh, and I have a tendency to do that, but the, there's a development tool in our zoning ordinance called the Plan Development Overlay. So um, this is where it becomes a little bit less black and white, but the planning development tool works as a negotiating tool between a prospective developer, the church, and the public and the city. And it's almost an in return for sort of situation. So as the applicant seeks to disassociate like commercial and office uses in a cafe from being tied to the church, but rather as a commercial enterprise on its own, they're willing to commit to not demolishing any of the buildings, keeping the church, restricting land uses, and it becomes kind of a, a guarantee, if you will, that there wouldn't be surprises in terms of them going out and, and demolishing the church or proposing land uses that are would be prohibited. So it kind of hands over the power of control over the property, even though they're asking for commercial uses, it hands control over to what those uses are what that site development could ultimately look like back to the community and ultimately to the city council who would make the, the final decision on whether to approve or not approve it. Um, that means that they would be tied to that illustrative site plan you saw in, in, on the screen earlier. They couldn't change it without coming back through this entire rezoning process. 
The development standards and the use restrictions that include undesirable uses, that would be codified by law. They could not do those uses. Um, any other conditions deemed necessary, perhaps by anybody that presents tonight from the public, the commission, or the council at a future hearing could be added. Uh, you could do use restrictions and say no bar cocktail lounge. You could add hours of operation restrictions on certain uses, things that actually aren't even currently restricted on the property. There's no hours of operation restriction for religious facility. Further, um, again, remember to consider that the site is on public facility. So we don't know what that might look like in the future. And you may not know at this time what that looks like until it's presented to us, but they wouldn't require a public hearing like this to do a public facility redevelopment of the whole site. That item would go directly to the design review board. So we wouldn't have a citizen review process because they have rights to the property. When they do the PD and the rezone, it would be codified. Uh, and, and limited at that point. They would also need to prepare a parking demand study. As a number of you mentioned in your public comments, there was concerns about the amount of parking available on site. So before any phase of development, if this project were to be successful, they'd need to do a parking demand study to demonstrate that um, certain uses would demand parking at one time of day or like perhaps on the weekend, like church facilities would have on a Sunday versus professional offices, which typically dominate the parking needs during the work week. Um, subsequent meetings as this pro uh, progresses forward, obviously tonight um, is the public hearing of PNZ. Um, we have an introduction, kind of like we did last month to City Council, just on the 20th, where we kind of hand over the exhibits so that they have now two months to, to deliberate over those. And they've been, the council, I understand, has been tracking public input closely on this. And then a council public hearing on September 21st. There wouldn't be a public hearing with council in August because there'll be a month recess, which is somewhat typical in the summer months for family vacations. It is also possible that if there were not to be action taken tonight to approve, deny, or approve with conditions that the PNZ could continue this item to their August 9th hearing if it was unable to come to a conclusion or take action otherwise tonight. So staff recommendation on the request, this has been a very difficult place for staff to look at this because when we hear the community saying, you know, protect our neighborhoods, protect our churches, you know, on one hand, the concern was how can we protect the church and the congregation if they sell the property and it's on public facility and could redevelop as any one of those uses we said, the city doesn't simply have the power or the wand to, to stop that from happening. They have, the prop, they have property rights and the church sees the property as an asset. So we were really concerned about how do we tell the public in the neighborhood that we can't protect their church. So as the applicant kind of maneuvered through the process, it was clear that an outright commercial rezoning was not going to be at least successful from a staff perspective because it wasn't wanted by the public and the public wanted to protect the church and they didn't want intrusion of commercial in, into their neighborhoods. It was concerns of traffic noise, et cetera, as typical of commercial. So at this point, staff has come to kind of a position of near neutrality on this because we're not really certain where the public stands today in regards to all of the changes that have occurred to this application as of even yesterday. So what we hope to hear from tonight as well as for this commission, I'm sorry to be so long winded, but I'm trying to get to the position statement of neutrality and why is that we really wanna hear from the public as to knowing that the congregation's gonna stay, that they can't demolish all those buildings, um, would there be any appetite amongst the public for some light commercial and professional offices on the site with a cafe or not, considering that the Sago congregation would remain on site for five years and the church isn't going anywhere and that they can't, that the power of that decision actually would rest in your hands now as well as the council. So it's a lot to consider um, and I'm happy to answer questions on this. It's just been a very kind of complex project and uh, we're here to help. Do any, any members of the commission have questions for Mr. Sings? On the site plan, it designates an area as neighborhood commercial. Is that, how is that different from commercial? Uh, thank you through the chair, uh, Commissioner Lawrence. Um, Neighborhood commercial, in our zoning ordinance, there are different gradations, if you will, of commercial land, commercial district intensities. Neighborhood commercial is the lightest commercial district that we have. It's the most restrictive where it's primarily geared towards um, 
office and retail and, and, and restaurant uses. Less of the intense stuff you see like automotive repair or things like a caliber collision or those sorts of things. So when you see neighborhood commercial on the site plan, the intention there uh, with the use limitations that we outlined before would be primarily geared towards professional office, perhaps boutique retail, and then a cafe and a rectory. Although they have asked for flexibility to move those uses around amongst, you know, in the existing buildings in the future phase. Are there other questions? Yes, come here. I know there's been a lot of feedback from the community on this particular topic. And I've read every letter and every email that everyone has sent to the city in the last couple of days. Um, I'd like to just say that we're not heathens, we're not anti-God, we do not hate the church because that, <clears throat> excuse me, has been the tone of some of the letters and the feedback that we've received. Um, in addition to that, I went back through each of the letters and everything that everyone had written because as Mr. Sanks had mentioned, this is a very fluid process and things are current and some people may have been opposed to this plan three weeks ago, but now that the church is being preserved and the body of believers, the, the worshipers are going to be able to continue to stay there and worship, they may have changed their minds. And so that's part of the reason I think that it makes this a very difficult position for us to be in as zoning commissioners. Um, I went back through each email, each letter, and I broke it down. And other than I believe three, everyone mentioned saving the church as well as making comments about commercial. And since the developer put in this provision to keep the building that houses the sanctuary as well as the chap chapel there. As I stated, some people may have a different opinion. If that is the main reason for the opposition for this project, then by the developer doing what he has done in the last week or so, that should no longer be a problem for you. However, if the real reason that everyone is as opposed to this development as many of you are because of commercial and you don't want to have any commercial activities on this property, you don't wanna have more activity, you don't wanna have businesses, then that's a completely different conversation that we need to have with you tonight. So for those of you who are going to speak, it's just my request that you be very specific about you either not wanting to have commercial in this area of Litchfield Park, or if you had concerns about preserving the church and the church buildings and how that was going to play out with this development. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Actually, right now, the issue is questions for thanks is okay. we're still in the public we're still in public hearing okay. um, anyway are there any questions for mr sanks yes down here the parking on site um is it is there enough parking or is there excess parking for the current congregation at the site and with the shared use concept is there concerns by the developer for viability of Sunday cafe operations. Thank you to the chair, um, Commissioner Frazier. Yes, the, and in the staff report, we directly addressed as well the concern of the example of the Sunday services in the morning and then a popular cafe, both actively using the site's parking. There would be concern on parking demand before the cafe could proceed. If, again, this is just proposing that the zoning was allowed to do this they would have to prepare a parking demand study for review and approval by community development department where we would actually look at time of use to see if it could actually function. If it can't function, we certainly wouldn't want cars spilling over onto any of the streets outside of the facility. That's a very important point. Um, we, are, we are anticipating, um, you know, in a, 
the, the, the that's a condition that's itemized in the report uh, for uh, for the commission to evaluate that the parking demand study would be required at each phase of development. So I think for the community, the cafe is probably an attractive feature. I mean, if it's a a question of viability of whether they can be open on Sunday, I think that's an important part of this process. If we, if it's something that cannot be used by the community on Sunday because the church is in service, um, I think that's something that we need to know. Okay, uh, unless there is a, another question for Mr. Sanks at this time, I think it would be appropriate to turn it over to the applicant's representative. Uh, from a legal standpoint, the applicant, as we say in the law, has the burden of proof. So this would be the applicant's opportunity um, to do that, to present. And as I understand it, there is a representative here who is part of the design group. Uh, sir, if you would come up to the microphone, state your name, uh, and then we'll hear your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Jason Harrington, principal and owner of Harrington Planning and Design. I'm a landscape architect and a planner. Uh, I represent uh, TriWest Realty in the proposed modifications to the existing site. Uh, said address, or well, What's you need an address <laughs> or not? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, TriWest Development is seeking to uh, compromise their original package uh, as mentioned. Um, with the input from the public from the public meeting that we had uh, conducted. Uh, that had meeting had expressed concerns from churchgoers, uh, several of which are not members of the Vistago community. Uh, and they wanted to retain the quantity of churches within Litchfield Park, uh, which the compromised site plan now does address as part of that. Uh, we are in a surplus of parking with the current conditions and with the proposed square footage and uses in relative relationship to your development code, we still maintain uh, above parking standards with that. Um, with that, um, the overlay could use some also additional restrictions uh, that could be imposed upon it for different uses and functions within there. Uh, we've created a list of those uh, features that um, we feel the community from their input would oppose. Uh, so we're again, we're seeking compromises to what was originally planned. Uh, it's never been proposed to be an entertainment district or anything like that. It does a front an arterial roadway. So uh, with its current uh, high visibility location, it's a good opportunity for this uh, transformation. We are keeping all the buildings intact. Uh, there will be uh, material facelifts as well as introduction of uh, public outdoor gathering spaces, uh, more of a neighborhood community walk-up uh, facilities that are proposed for that. Uh, a lot of the improvements would generate uh, an economic value for the community of Litchfield Park in a lot of sales tax dollars from transactions as well as uh, rental income from real estate. Uh, all of these things we feel are uh, positive improvements from uh, its current uses. Uh, as also mentioned, the facility is for sale, whether it's purchased by this local entity who is a resident of Litchfield Park or whether it's um, sold in the future to an, an outside entity, perhaps even outside the state of Arizona. Uh, we feel that uh, having a local uh, invest their passions into um, the urban fabric of Litchfield Park, that's uh, the positive that we're hoping to get support from the community on, as well as support from the commission. Uh, as noted also, we have received the letter of support uh, from the um, church membership leadership in saying that they're supporting the five-year lease, uh, which is the beginning lease, uh, can continue on from that as well. Uh, other functions and features uh, with that uh, would be that the um, theater of a, a, a children's uh, presentation, things like that. So it can become a community asset as well uh, for not just a church facility, it can be a multi-purpose. Uh, right now, a lot of times it's vacant. And so we're trying to activate that space with this adaptive reuse. Um, with that, um, the owner will also be involved in the management of the site as well. So they're not just an investor. Um, a tri will will um, manage the site as well, just for clarification. 
Um, with that, if you have any questions, let me know if I've, I've glanced over a few things that, that uh, you specifically want to, to uh, gather from me for information. Uh, I'm available as the owner's representative. Questions from the commissioner? Well, I have a, I have a question. Um, one of the things that's different now that, that came up very recently is the arrangement, which is not part of all of the zoning and whatnot, is the arrangement you're having with existing church for this five-year commitment. That's all outside of what we're doing. So I guess my question of you is, there's really no way to know whether the Stago Church will still be there in five years. Uh, economic realities are such that things come and go. So you can't guarantee that there's gonna be a church there for all of the five years, but that I get that that's the intent, but that may not be, you know, there are, you know, churches sometimes do very well and sometimes not so well depending on their own, their own leadership. So for this commission, I would think the assumption, it's great that you have made that and I'm not questioning anybody's intent. It's great that you've come to an arrangement with the church, but I think we all need to be aware that isn't there's not going to be anything in here that i think that forces them to have that particular church or any church you know in that building uh, it could be that down the road visago for whatever reason leaves the developer then an owner would be trying to find someone to fill that fill that space so it, you know things could change so i'm not <clears throat> i'm not trying to be a wet blanket here i just want to make that comment before we get too excited about the church being around for the next five years that's the intent uh that appears to be what the neighborhood wants so hopefully that would be better but anyway um are there are there any from people on zoom are there any questions for the developers representative the chair uh and commissioners, I'm watching uh, if commissioners Faith or do I have any initial comments for staff or now for the, the applicants representative and I'm getting nods for no on both. Okay. I'm checking Com Commissioner Dari, do you have any questions? Dari, sorry, not Dari. No. Nope. Okay, well, we're still in the public hearing portion and one of my thoughts for the for the discussion here. They've given us a list of, of things. And my question for the commission is if, and we haven't yet taken input from the people that want to speak, so we're still in public hearing, but moving beyond that, and after we hear from the neighbors that are here that want to speak, are we comfortable enough with where we are to close the public hearing, or do we want to leave it open until our next you know, our next meeting to allow for more participation uh, from people that are that are out there. And I'm not necessarily suggesting it. I'm just trying to get a feel because to me, as things kept changing, it was just about the time that I felt like I had a good handle on it. All of a sudden, we have a whole new thing and we're going a different direction. And I was trying to figure out where we are now. Maybe that's a question for you. If the the original goal was the church was going to have buildings were going to have a much bigger role now they're not now it sounds to me like all of that stays and what we're left with as far as commercial is a little bit of office space to the one side and the existing rectory buildings that i understand is where the coffee shop would go is that all we're talking about from a commercial standpoint now going forward The preservation of the three structures have always been from day one. Uh, it's just the repurposing of the use of those facilities. That's the only thing that would ever change. So it's never been proposed to demolish, tear down, rebuild, restore, reconstruct. With this process that we're going through, you can see it's been pretty contentious. So there is a proposal for a future phase for another 4,000 square foot or so structure that could be added in the future. Uh, I cannot determine the future at the moment. Could be five years, could be 10 years, who knows? But
but we're going through the process again to add that building in the future it would be a, a painful process. So at this time, we would like to include that as potential for the future. And again, that would be a restricted use, restricted structure, limited height, limited materials that would go through your normal approval process through DRB. Uh, so all three structures would be uh, retained on site. It's just reinventing them that instead of a daycare facility or a, a reception hall, it's now purpose to be office space. Instead of the living quarters for the pastor, now it's proposed to be some sort of a, a retail environment that uh, offers amenities to the neighborhood as a walk-up uh, feature or as a cafe space for uh, churchgoers or, or other people in the area. Um, so, so we've never kind of proposed that it was going to be a, a, a tear down rebuild uh, process. Does, does that answer your question or? Well, no, I understand. But I guess what I'm saying is when I was first reading this, there was discussion about uh, a lot of, you know, uses for some of those buildings that are now going to stay and not be used. So I was trying to look at the overall site of what is left that is actually going to be commercial. And it looks to me like there's not that much that is going to be commercial and i don't have a you know we have an application and then there's been a lot of changes going along and i'm just trying to figure out weeding through the wheat from the chaff if you will as to where we are now as to what we're being asked to approve because it's, to me it seems like there's a lot kind of going on the fly right now and at least for me it makes it difficult to know how some how to even propose a motion if someone want whether they wanted to, you know, it's easy to have a motion to deny because you don't have to figure it out. You just say deny. But if somebody, if the majority wanted to approve, the question is, what are we approving now? And we have a list of things that, you know, we're seeing tonight is, you know, that we've only seen, gotten recently. And I'm, just, I don't know about the rest of the commission, but I'm a little uncomfortable of trying to figure it out now on the on the fly, which is why I brought up the idea about because once we close the once we close the public hearing and there is no more public hearing, it's just us deciding. I mean, we can have other things come in, but that was my, my question: is that if we were going to continue this, what you know, in my opinion, if we were going to do that, we should leave the public hearing open, which allows additional citizens that have had a chance to look at it now with the new thing. And may have a different opinion than they had before, you know, or they may be just as opposed as ever because the changes don't impact what their objection was. So that was kind of where I was going and I was kind of hoping, I'm still not getting a really good feel. Of, I drive by there and I see the church buildings and I know years ago the Rotary Club used to meet in their fellowship hall. So I'm familiar with kind of the layout and there's obviously some the church has some office space. And then we're talking about out in the parking lot, maybe having some office space there. And then this other area that originally was referred to as sort of the rectory would be where the coffee shop or sandwich shop or whatever it is. And I'm just looking at the total project that the developer is taking on. And I'm just, and I'm not a real estate uh, expert by any means, you know. Uh, there's lots of lawyers around that do that, that have a better feel. I'm just looking at the footprint of what you have and the part that's gonna be commercial and the part that maybe would be generating sales tax, which the city might want the sales tax. And I'm just not, it just seems like that footprint is shrinking as to the part of what we're, we're talking about. It, that the compromise has been driven from the public input. So the retention of the public facility space, which could be neighborhood commercial, which could be your economic engine, is being limited. Uh, and that's based upon the public's uh, feedback that we've been given. But the compromise we feel is, is uh, the best value in moving forward with the vision that's been created by the developer. So retaining the public facility, uh, the church operations would be there for the five years. And when they're not in service or having events, it can be repurposed for uh, leasable space, uh, much like this auditorium and in, in what it's being used for tonight. It's not structured and programmed for council meetings. It's programmed for church events, but it's being repurposed. So this would become another community asset, another facility that could be cross-utilized for gathering events, weddings, other types of 
of uh, community events uh, for a performance theater. Uh, the interior of the structure uh, has a, a, a great AV system. And so again, it can be used for school plays or you know, other events that, that would require a facility like that. Uh, the rectory itself, again, it can be repurposed to be a, a cookie store or, or some kind of a small cafe space or uh, uh, knitting supplies, shop, something like that. But that public facility would have your restrictions of your current zoning. So whatever you allow today for public facility would be continued within that portion of the developed parcel. The remaining three quarters of the parcel is being proposed to do the neighborhood commercial with the planned development overlay. So the neighborhood commercial, there would be two structures that are existing today that would be repurposed and used for, uh, as was mentioned by Mr. Sanks, possibly an attorney space, uh, possibly nail salon, who knows what. Uh, it, there's no tenant uh, on the books right now that is proposed to occupy the space. So it would be whatever the uh, management company can, can gather for uses. Those uses can be restricted with this planning overlay. So the planning development overlay can tell uh, based upon community input, what they can and can't do to fill that vacant space uh, for the neighborhood commercial. Again, to generate sales tax dollars or to generate office space, uh, things like that. The uh, living establishment would be converted into another structure. Again, it's not fixed as being a coffee shop or any other type of particular function. It's having the ability to become something like that where you can pop in, grab and go, leave or possibly stay and have a social opportunity to communicate with your neighbors uh, in the area. The future structure would be based upon the success of those two structures as uh, the community um, desires more different uses and other facilities um, as a neighborhood destination, uh, those things would grow. So it would really be dependent upon people who come and spend their money there, whether future development even occurs. If it's not successful, they would never grow to that. Uh, we have heard opposition that there's uh, the proposed development for your community core. Uh, that's more of a, a high impact commercial. That's not neighborhood. That's not mom and pop. It's, it's um, nationwide retail. And so this facility offers a choice. It's not in competition. It's in complementation of the neighborhood development. So that's how we're, we're proposing the remaining structures to be utilized if this is passed. I think it would be very helpful to flesh out some of these uses just a little bit more about what possibly could be there. For instance, if you tell me it's just a, as they call it in the plan, a casual fast restaurant, fast casual restaurant, go in, place an order, uh, and then have it delivered to your table or just take it and go, but higher quality food, et cetera, uh, that's fine. But is this a cafe that is, um, open say from 7 a.m. and closes at three, are we doing breakfast and lunch? Or then you tell me there's possible for a bar and a bar has a whole different uh, look and feel to me. So um, I, you know, the neighborhood might be more open to cafe, maybe not so much a bar. I did hear a 10 o'clock closing. Now, yeah, as a resident would not be uh, in favor of having all that activity and everything going till 10 o'clock at night. So I just think it would be helpful to kind of flesh out a little bit more what kind of, well, I know it's not specific because you don't have a tenant yet, but just, you know, put that first and then the, look for the tenant. That's the beauty of the plan development overlay is those restrictions can be uh, vocalized by the community and you as the commission can enforce uh, whether those vocalizations are appropriate or not. Uh, time limitations on different uses are something that uh, is welcomed. If there's something that would um, be a compromise from the community input, um, we would want to play fairly with other peer developments within your community in terms of restrictions. But um, that's, again, the reason why we're, we're uh, requesting the, um, the overlay with it, the plan development part of it to, to uh, limit those functions and uses and to offer compromises to the surrounding neighborhoods uh, in terms of bars and things like that. Again, you have other codes that restrict those things. The separation of space from the, the church facility and the public facility land usage. Uh, you have liquor licenses. There, there, there's several uh, hurdles to clear in order to, to do certain functions within there. So um, I, I highly doubt that a bar would ever be successful or proposed for this. Uh, but as uh, 
um, Mr. Sanks had mentioned uh, a restaurant facility that might offer wine or something that would be a brunch facility uh, could could offer um, restricted um, beverages as, as part of that negotiation. And if you need a continuance in order to vet some of these things or to, to weigh the input from the public, we're open to continuing this uh, without closing it. Okay, are there, maybe at this point, it would be a good idea to let the public that has asked to speak, you know, have their say, and then we can come back to the, allow the developers uh, agent here to respond. So if there's no objection, I'm, I'm gonna do that. And we'll call these in the order that they were, they were turned in. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Let, thank Chair, you if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. This, um, just to, for the community to understand too, we'll be doing the combination of citizen participation on our new hybrid format via Zoom, raising the digital hand versus also the people in the public. We have also had a request to speak by a member of the public. She requested if she could speak early on. Um, her right, name we, is, I believe Hope. So, yeah, we have that. Perfect, you got it, thank you. Okay, um, is Hope Gamble here? Yes, would you come on up? Microphone, state your name please. Hope Gamble, I'm at 13029 West Campbell Avenue, Litchfield Park. Um, in regard to the rezoning, I have a prepared speech. It's been kind of rethought. At risk here are elected positions, appointed positions, and the reputation of Litchfield Park. The city sold a general plan to the residents, but now the developer wants you to violate that plan and the voters trust. Keep commercial in the current designated area. The laws that give you the power to keep the church facility and make restrictions for property use also give the same power to future planning commissions and city council to remove those restrictions, including church use. By rezoning it to a neighborhood commercial, you open the doors for a future bar, hookah bar, convenience store, pawn shop, etc. Abendale and Goodyear prove that these businesses become havens for homeless. As it is now during the past two years, there has been an increase in homeless people sleeping at the Tierra Verde Park. A no vote will maintain the city's reputation and the beauty of Tierra Verde Park. A yes vote will cost the city money for additional police and maintenance, which will use up the promised tax revenue. Alcohol increases the violent crime rate in a community, which increases police costs when the area becomes unsafe. The city is able to maintain the Terrier, Tierra Verde Park now because the daily walkers assist by picking up the trash and feces left by the current visitors. Most visitors, excuse me, more visitors will increase maintenance costs of the park and surrounding roads. Currently during city so uh, children's soccer city season at Stag Park, there is not ample street parking and the pedestrian traffic increases a factor that I believe is not reflected in the analysis. Increased factor traffic will put these children at risk as well as school children down the street. The University of Cornell Bird Watchers Society considers Tierra Verde a bird sanctuary. They monitor track and record the unique waterfowl. Because the birds stray into the streets, recently there have been several birds killed by moving vehicles. Increased traffic will increase the risk of the death of unique waterfall and fowl and possibly draw the negative attention of the society. A no vote will mean you are making the community, the residents and the park preservation your priority. A yes vote will mean you value the interest of the developer above the voting public's interest. Please vote no. I commend you for having an in-person meeting and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to call on Tim, looks like Hovancic. I may have mispronounced that. If I did, I'm sorry. But come on up, Tim, and state your, state your name for the record, please. Yeah, Tim Hovancic, I'm 14250 West Wigwam Boulevard. Been a resident here for about four and a half years, but prior to that, I was here in 1980 about 80, uh, 89. Uh, I'm a retired golf professional and coach, coach and 
the environment and what we have here in Lichfield Park is amazing. And uh, I just, uh, just here as a devout Christian, um, um, I believe in the neighborhood church is vital, the original fo uh, uh, founders of our city and those who have planned for decades see that value. Uh, once the zoning changes, who knows what's gonna happen. And even the proposed for five, five years, what does that mean? Uh, service on Sunday at, from eight o'clock to nine o'clock or uh, having uh, children's recitals there and men's group, women's group. There's a lot more to church than Sunday morning. Uh, and I just feel that church is a be benefit and contributor to the intensive ways to Richfield Park. And the value we have here is immense. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, the next request to speak is from Carl Hartman. Sir, if you'll come on up to the mic and then state your name, please. Yes, I am Carl Hartman, 258 Laguna Drive East just uh, right off the lake. So I'm very familiar with the subject property. I'm not very impressed with the developer, however. If you look at his report, or he doesn't even know where the property is located. He says it's located on the northwest corner of Indian School and Old Litchfield Road. I would hope that he would have the respect for everyone's time and would proofread that that he is writing. Things, statements that he has made in the past have constantly changed. It's a kaleidoscope. Mr. Ledger, to your point, it, it, we seem to have a moving target here. Litchfield Park is known to be a residential community. We have taken great steps in defining city center Litchfield Square and that's where commercial development should occur, not on the periphery. A statement was made by uh, Mr. O'Connor that he wanted that to become the south entrance to city center. Nothing could be more insane than to try to funnel all that traffic by Stag Park with all the kids out there playing soccer, the kids walking to Tierra Verde feeding the ducks, and then Litchfield Elementary. It's a, we need to use the entrance that's under construction currently. But one of my concerns is the land use that is being mentioned on the, uh, uh, the most recent proposal is auditorium. I can't find auditorium in the matrix. And I challenge all of you up there, show me in the matrix, section 28, where there is a land use called auditorium. I can find one that's called community facility. And I think that's what that's really should be called if it were to go through. It's something akin to, to Sowers Hall. This is, I would call it a multi-purpose room. I have voted in here. I have attended uh, city council meetings here. They're talking about doing plays and uh, things like that in the, the, the Vestago church building. To me, that's a, community facility. But if you can show me where there is a land use called auditorium, all well and good. I mentioned it to someone and they said, well, if you look in section 29, that's where you talk about parking and they talk about it, uh, auditorium and theater there. That is not where you define land use because there's no zoning matrix. How do we know where you can have an auditorium? Yeah, so, there just seem to be a lot of unanswered questions. Again, a, an ever-changing kaleidoscope of uses that they're proposing. And from the May 17th meeting, my objection at that time that I expressed very vehemently was, this is re a residential area. It is not a commercial area. Let's keep the commercial development city center and not on the periphery or any other spots that might pop up. 
I appreciate the fact that the council is reconsidering the points that, um, I'm sorry, the commission, uh, because when I first read the uh, agenda packet, 100, all 141 pages, Daniel Lossitz did a tremendous job to get that pulled together. Thank you, Daniel. Um, but I, like you, uh, Commissioner Alvey, read each and every one of those. And to me, the sentiment there is, we don't need commercial down here. Yes, let's preserve it as a church. Let's maintain that character at that point of the park, but we don't need commercial development at, at that point. So I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to uh, express my opinion. Hopefully we can uh, keep the discussion open because I think there are a tremendous number of unanswered questions at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And the next request to speak is from Woody Thomas. Woody, come on up and state your name for us, please. Sure will. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Commission. My name is Woody Thomas. I'm, I live at 220 and Cora Drive North. Uh, that's across the Stags Park from this area. And I, I've heard it uh, a couple of times, and I just want to re reinforce the idea of our city plan. Mike Cartsonis uh, with Gruen Associates and, and stuff had devised the city plan, and it's working quite well, as you've heard. With that in mind, the idea of making that um, neighborhood um, commercial from what is it now the uh, public facility and I'm okay with public facility and that's consistent with the overall plan within the city. Uh, we have that city center that has the, the library, the, the elementary school, the rec center, then the commercial and that's what that's where all the activity should be. When we get down in my neighborhood, let's keep it into the neighborhood area. As far as what the developer has said, um, I've got the letter here from Tri West, and in there he mentioned that he wanted to have a, a restaurant slash pub. And so that was his intent from the beginning, to, was to have a pub. Uh, St. Peter's Episcopal Church is right across the street, and there may have been an issue with that. But again, that's because we're now going to be conflating commercial with residential or neighborhood uses, and that's where St. Peter's comes in. The other thing in, in the application I read from the developer, he was talking about uh, seeking the highest and best use of the property. My experience in city government is many uh, city officials don't understand who's responsible for highest and best use, and that's you all. That the test for highest and best use is, is it physically possible, is it lawful and permitted? That's the second, and then is it feasible and the maximally feasible? And so it's up to the city's ordinances and zonings to say what is permitted on that property, and that's where that's your responsibility. With that, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Okay, the next request to speak looks like Cameron Schaffner. Okay, if you'll state your name for the record, please. I'm Cameron Schaffner, and I own a business here in Ridgefield Park, uh, 111 West Wigwam Boulevard, Suite C. Um, I have a couple points I wanted to make, as well as just state that I'm a West Valley resident. Um, I live in Buckeye, grew up here my whole life and am very close to the area. We frequent all of the restaurants, stay at the Wigwam, are here all the time. Um, I'm in support of the rezoning. I appreciate everyone's feedback and thoughts on the matter. And I understand this is their home and where they live and you know where they raise their families. Um, it's also where I raise my family and where I bring my family. Uh, the lack of available retail, office, and commercial space in the West Valley, and specifically in Litchfield Park, poses additional challenges for small business owners who want to grow and build their brand within the community. This lifestyle center will provide these small businesses a place to do that, while still maintaining the neighborhood charm that is currently here. I think this has been very well thought out, um, planned, and I think the vision that the developer is trying to accomplish is maybe a little um, a little hidden from some of the community's eyes right now, just because of, like you guys said, having changes throughout the process. Um, 
So I think maybe that communication needs to be translated better. Uh, being from a small town and knowing that I have to drive, you know, into the city to actually go shopping, have, you know, meet a lawyer, go to the tax attorney, um, do any of those services isn't only frustrating, but it's just even more so because of the fact that the West Valley has grown so much. Our population isn't going down, it's going up. But the services that we actually provide the community here and the other members um, of the surrounding communities is lacking. I think this development will help to provide additional uh, options for food, culture, and services that would benefit the community and small businesses. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next request to speak is, appears to be, I'm not sure about the last name. It looks like David Drew. State your name for the record, please. Sure, yeah, it is David Drew. Nice, nicely done there. Um, I am a recent uh, resident of Litchill Park. I am also a longtime resident of the West Valley. Um, just really briefly, just kind of like want to express my support for the plan. Um, I am fully in support of the rezoning of the uh, lot subject to the amendment. Uh, as a longtime resident of the West Valley and a new resident of Litchill Park specifically, I see the rezoning as a spectacular opportunity to expand and deepen the offerings and uh, and assets of the side of town. Uh, in my experience, meeting in leisure locations like this enrich communities and bring out innovators and artists of which Phoenix could really use a lot more. Also, I like this. I like that the uh, that this reuses structures that are already in place. Uh, it's a great way to reduce ecological footprint um, when we're expanding our areas and uh, expanding our offerings. And I think it's a shining example of compromise uh, in that it will continue to offer worship facilities. And even if there is a uh, guarantee that the church will remain, uh, this plan seems to work more towards that outcome than any other possibility. So I think it's a win-win-win. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, at this point, uh, I'm gonna call, ask for the applicant's representative to come. Yeah. And Chair, you if you don't mind. Um, we have a, a couple of requests, I believe, through Zoom as part of the hybrid format for public um, participation. Okay, I was not aware of that. Oh, sorry. So, Oh, I'm sorry. There. Yes, there is. Uh, Mr. Let's do Mr. Blazik, and then we'll get the Zoom. Room. Mr. Randall Blazik, would you come up, please? Sorry, I wasn't trying to intentionally. That's okay. No, sir. Up. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And um, uh, it's Randall Blazik. I live at 601 Old Litchfield Road. I've uh, been a resident for uh, 10 or 11 years. <clears throat> I always find it interesting when I come to the meetings and it seems like uh, there's these cohorts of people who speak and it's always seems like it's eight or nine people who speak on one behalf and then there's three or four people who speak on the other behalf. And I don't know if that's intentional or not, but I am here to, to speak in support of the project. And, and the reason why I, I would speak in that aspect, much like the two previous people, is I look at Litchfield Park as a city for growth. And um, I see it as an opportunity for us to expand um, our, our uh, footprint here in Litchfield Park, but also our surrounding cities to bring people to the area. That's the whole purpose of the city center. That's what we have on Litchfield, uh, on Old Litchfield Road with the restaurants. And I think to have an aspect of the city that would draw attention to the city on Indian School is, is a, is a, is, is, would be popular. Um, I believe that we currently have four churches in a very small city. So the idea that, you know, let's maintain this place just because it's another church, I don't really agree with it. I think we have three other churches that are still be here, and there's a ton of places around for other people to worship. And I think if you look at our small city footprint and that we have four current churches, it certainly is out of balance in terms of the percentage of the population and the square mileage of the city. Um, I think that the developer has gone above and beyond to try and be collaborative in this work. And I think that's the whole purpose of the city center, the city center and the idea and how, we've, how we're building it took years in the process to develop that. And it took a lot of public input. 
and and I, I welcome that. I think the developer welcomes it, and it's it's shown in his um, change of his initial plan. And I, I would also mention that probably many of the petition signatures were misled in terms of what was going to occur in that the church was going to be tore down, that the church was no longer going to be there. And, and here he has adopted his basic you know, idea of how he's going to move forward. And I think to your point, uh, Commissioner Layard, nobody can tell what the future is. That church could be there five years. It could be there 10 years. It could be there one year. That whole corner, if this developer doesn't buy it, some other developer might. It might it's not going to always sell to another church. And it might be just the same old thing. And I think I welcome the idea that it's a local person that wants to develop a corner of Litchfield Park. So I'm in favor of it. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so we have some people on Zoom that want to speak, I understand. Yes, Chair, thank you. I think I'll need to coordinate with um, staff to unmute. Um, Rachel Dudley has uh, raised her hand to speak via Zoom. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Great, okay. Uh, All right, go ahead and try. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear? Yep, they can hear you. If you awesome, speak, okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so my name is Rachel Dudley. I live on East Estero Lane. I've lived here since 2012. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I am in favor of this rezoning. I'll state that up front. Um, I've been trying to kind of organize my, my thoughts on exactly why, and um, it's, it's been difficult. So I'm gonna, I want to just um, use a quote that I've stolen from Jane Jacobs, who's the author of a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And she says, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And um, I, I think that's a really important thought right now because I think um, we, this is a, a really interesting rezoning case because it's, we kind of are talking about who we want to be as a community and what we're going to be and what our, our goals and values are. And I think when I'm hearing pros and cons um, from everybody in the community, I think that what I'm hearing is that everybody really does feel we, we have the same um, values. We just don't have necessarily the same idea on how to get there. Um, so I think we all want to live in a vital community that, that has a lot of life and has a lot of opportunities for community engagement and um, incubation of new ideas and um, and support small businesses. And it sounds to me like the developer is definitely trying to do this. He's obviously compromising with, with the community and trying to hear the feedback. Um, so um, I think that rezoning would, would support um, our community and moving forward to be more, to have more opportunities for, to do those things. Um, bottom line also is I think that right now the, the current property is under leverage. I think that it's um, as in its current state, I don't want to see it stay that way because it's it's kind of um, it's such a, a jewel of a property and could be a jewel of an architectural element for our community, but it sort of um, needs a little bit of polishing. So I love that this developer is talking about keeping all the existing buildings and um, but just making it fit more with what we want our community to um, say about ourselves. Um, I think also that when we're talking about, you know, exactly what uses, I think that we should probably, you know, my favorite thing to say is we often meet our destiny on the path we choose to avoid it. Um, I think if we try to over control and over manage every aspect of the zoning, we're gonna end up with something that's a compromise that actually serves none of us well. So I think what the best thing that we can do is to try to just um, guide what's happening uh, as best as we can without getting too um, in the weeds about, you know, this use and that use. I mean, obviously, I understand the concerns that everybody has about, you know, specific uses, but we'll never be able to completely X out all potential uses. You know, the, the human imagination can come up with all kinds of things that would be negative for our community. So I think we just need to trust our um, city leadership and our, and our city processes and the laws and rules that we have um, to, to guide us on that. 
Um, I think that's, that's all I would like to say. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. Uh, was there another request to speak from Zoom? Chair, I'm, I'm just monitoring the Zoom room. Um, I'm not certain if there, there's quite a few attendees via Zoom, but I haven't seen any other hands go up to speak or just wanna make sure that the attendees understand that if they do wish to speak, um, you know, that they can raise their hand in the Zoom format if they're attending online, if they wanna speak. Otherwise, I mean, they're not obligated, of course, but I don't see any other hands. Further, if, um, if you don't know how to use the hand to speak function, you can open the chat room and type to everyone in the chat room that you wish to speak and a member of city staff will capture that so that we can open the mic for you. Or of course, if your video is on, you can wave at us, but I don't see a lot of videos on. <laughs> We're trying everything to facilitate, so. Um, commission, uh, Chair and Commission, I. I don't believe we have anybody else to speak. Okay, um, at this at this point, I think it would be appropriate then to let the developer representative come back up and give us any further comments that they may have. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just a couple other points that I had uh, forgot to mention in my initial presentation is uh, again per your development ordinances. Traffic studies and parking studies would be required. Uh, it can also be stipulated as, as part of the controlling the development itself. Um, we feel that there are compromises available to limit access uh, to the northern uh, residential street, and we want to try to limit that access point. Uh, we are proposing other compromises on the site that include relocation of the existing dumpster, so heavyweight vehicles are not creating noise or uh, circulation impacts um, differing, what's, what's different from today's activities as well. Um, there's been a lot of good points both for and against. Uh, the biggest one that I'd like to react to is the, the ever-moving and ever-changing, I think the term was kaleidoscope. Uh, that's the evolution of our compromise in finding that uh, we want to listen and hear what the community wants to say and be reactive to that to find a win-win for everybody uh, versus being adamant and sticking to the original design process. So uh, I looked at and welcome for additional input in uh, guiding us to helping define the um, uh, planned development portions of the neighborhood uh, commercial use. Again, this is very small square footages that we're talking about for the commercial usages which would in turn uh, essentially limit what could and could not be um, feasible within the site. Uh, thank you. Do any of the commission members have any questions for the applicant representative? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point, I think we, I think we need to, dis to decide whether uh, are we, comfortable with taking any action right now, yes or no, or do we want to leave the hearing open, which would allow and, and continue it to a date certain, which would be our next P and Z meeting. The applicant indicated they would not be opposed to that. And my, my biggest concern at this point is making sure that there was, there was so much public interest uh, but it, it was, and you, uh, Commissioner Oldie made a good comment that it was pretty well evenly split. Half the people had, didn't have much to say about the church, but they didn't want any commercial. There were other people that really wanted to save uh, the church that, that maybe said they didn't like commercial, but it looked to me like maybe it was a reason why they wanted to keep the church. Now, like I've pointed out and uh, you know, some of the speakers have mentioned as well, there's no guarantee about the church, whether it'll be there or not. I mean, churches are an, you know, an interesting institution because uh, some of them do very well, some do not, and it may, it may or may not be there in the future. And the question is, if we were to approve this application as modified, we need to make sure that it's part of whatever is done that 
say in the future the church wasn't there anymore that for whatever reason they're out of there and the developer couldn't find another church we want to be very careful about what they're allowed to do from a change we can't force them to keep it as a church so we just need to be able to know what we're getting into so my thoughts would be that um, considering that that maybe we should keep the hearing open continue it to the next stated meeting and if we do that it, the developer doesn't have to, probably doesn't have to re-notice if we don't do that they have to go through the whole notice process again which would not be fair to them but i would like to at least have two things happen and this is just me talking the commission may disagree one i would like to give the the neighbors down there that live in that area and they're the ones that have been the most interested obviously another chance to tell us you know what they think of the compromise you know or not and then the other thing i would really like would be maybe the developer and staff working together could propose a draft of what they're talking about so that the commission would know what we're voting on and of course the commission could always say well this is all well and good but i don't like paragraph d or g those have to go but at least we'd have something in front of us that i think would make it easier now if we do that the remaining agenda items all have to be continued as well because they're based on this hearing being done so those are my thoughts and i'll, I'll leave it open now for a discussion from the other commissioner Uh, you need to come up to the mic and state your name and we can't have everybody during this meeting so my name is Brene Morin I am a resident of the Litchfield Park proper I'm on Cabrito Circle right by the lake my concern is uh, it was mentioned that well some of the letters mentioned the church and some of the letters mentioned commercial and we're kind of wondering now should we give the opportunity for people to maybe rethink what they voted. So I'm concerned, I wrote a letter. I contacted Mr. Um, O'Connor, who said that he was going to put every comment that he received into the review. So one, I'd just like to know, how do I know if he did that? Where can I find those review documents? Andrew. 151 of those and they're at city hall and you can go there uh, i think they're on are they online daniel they're online so you can go online you can read all of those are public records okay. so our concern was or my concern was their their change came in just literally within the last few days there are right. people that were at the neighborhood meeting back in may that aren't aware of aren't aware of that and they may be happy with the change or they may not it may not i just want to know that they've been given ample opportunity to address that what we have in front of us now is different than what was at the neighborhood meeting in may my concern is that do i have to be worried that my opposition to this project to the rezoning that i have stated do I have to worry that that's going to be interpreted differently because, well, I didn't mention church or I mentioned commercial? Um, because it seems like now I have to do all of my efforts again. Is my mic on? You don't have to do anything. We're just giving people another opportunity to come to the next meeting and state and then what they want. And then ultimately, this commission is going to make an independent decision. We've gone through the process of taking information. Something has changed. So I want to make sure that people are given the opportunity because some people may still be opposed. Others, others may not, but it's not an election. In other words, 100, 191 with 150 some in opposition and 40, whatever it was in favor. We're not taking a vote. It's an end of, we're getting input. And then we make a recommendation to the city council and they ultimately decide. So there'll be another hearing in front of, at the city council, you know, going through the process. So this is just preliminary as to what we're doing. So rather than take a vote today where some people 
out there may have a different view than they had. And some of them, some of when you read through all those, you'll see there are some that are very adamant about keeping the church, and they talk about the importance of that. There's other people that are talking that don't, you know, you can reading their letter didn't care much about the church, but they either did or didn't like the idea of the commercial commercial use. So I right. want to make sure everybody has a fair fair chance. And then just as a practical matter from our standpoint, it's help it will be helpful at this point if there could be something, and I don't care whether the applicant does a proposal, uh, you know, pared down. You know, I came to the meeting with, I made my own notebook, you know, something down that's a little easier to digest. So we know exactly at this point in time what we're voting on, because there's some certain things that apply to uh, the uh, PD overlay. There are certain things that apply to the other. And I know based on right now, I'm a little confused with all the changes at the, over the last week. So that's where, that's where we are, but you don't have to change anything. If you really want it, you know, your best bet, if you're concerned is to come to the next, the next meeting, you don't have to turn anything in writing if you don't want to, but come to the meeting and do just what you're doing right now. And it's, you can express your interest again, or you can, there's nothing that says the, this process is still open. If, if the council or the commission votes to leave the hearing open, anybody out there that wants to supplement what they said before, they can do that. So. Well, and I'm concerned with the people that turned in their yay or nay already are not here because a lot of people are not here right. and they won't know that at well, some point, oh, well, I could come to another meeting or maybe they can't make it. I just want to make sure that what's already been received is not going to mm, be interpreted by somebody else when it clearly says I'm opposed no. to the rezoning. No, it's part of the record. Okay. And all of us have read everything there. And then ultimately the commission members individually are going to decide how they want to vote. Okay. Thank We're you so much. Giving another opportunity for people that are out there should they want to supplement. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, back to where we were, I was asking whether any of the in favor of continuing um i think one of the things that would be helpful for everybody here to see is a map generally characterizing the yays and nays so i took the time i read all your letters um i mapped every single address that i could find i would characterize the yays as north and east of litchfield park and the nos the nays concentrated in the southwest so the the people that are worried about the impact and closest to this facility are saying no the people that are furthest away are saying yes. I think that's a, if we could produce a map, you don't have to put a pin on people's exact houses. We don't need that, but a general picture so, so that we can understand it and everybody here can understand who's for this project and who's against it. Any, any, any further comments? Any of our folks on Zoom? The com commissioners up there having any comments? Hello, Commissioner Barry has a comment. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob right, Barry. Just one moment. I'm going to unmute my mic or my speaker phone. Right. If you can speak loudly, Commissioner Barry. Yes, um, I would like to suggest that what you opened up with, uh, Chairman, is that we postpone this. And I agree that there is too many open ends right now uh, and too many areas of question in my mind that I could vote one way or the other and feel comfortable. Uh, I feel that uh, being a resident of Litchfield Park uh, and being sitting in this position, uh, I need to have more information that solidifies where we're going and looking to the future. And so I would uh, support your request that maybe we suspend this and move to the next meeting in September. And between now and then, 
more of the I's can be dotted, more of the T's can be crossed. Thank you. Well, the next meeting would be in August. What's the? August 9th. August sure. 9th. OK. Someone, uh, we've, we've already kind of talked about it, but someone needs to make a motion that to keep the public hearing open and continue it to our regular meeting on August 9th. Okay. We, we have a we have a motion. Is there a second? No, Commissioner Derry is second. Okay. Is Commissioner Derry second. Uh, anyway, so the motion is to keep the hearing open, continue it to a date certain, August 9th, where the we'll, we'll we will reconvene. And as part of that motion, we're also continuing these other agenda items as well. Um, so if, if you, if, do you agree you've added that to the motion, the, the remaining ones as well? Okay, so we have a motion and a second to do that. And also there's sort of an understanding that staff will work with the developer to maybe flesh out something, bullet points, something that would assist us going forward. There's no guarantee we're going to approve it, but it would, you know, what, whatever you call it, what are we going to call it, a summary, whatever that would be pared down so we would have a better feel for what we have. And there was also a request from um, Commissioner Fraser about the map with the points. I'd love to see that too, if staff, you know, can do that, just a nice visual aid as we're going forward. So we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye and raise your hand if you're on Zoom. Aye. aye. Are there any opposed? Okay, don't see any opposed. So unanimously it is continued to our August meeting. Okay, and that moving, moving forward, what's left here? Okay, commissioner's report on current events. Does any commissioner have a report on current events? Don't see any volunteers. Uh, staff report on current events. Uh, uh, Chair, commissioners, uh, members of the public that have stayed behind to listen uh, for the remainder of the hearing. A couple items, we're gonna have a very busy, uh, aside from the normal items of business for council, we'll have some planning items on uh, the council agenda for introduction on the 20th, um, the first lot, lot three within uh, Litchfield Square was approved conditionally by the Design Review Board. Um, and it will be brought to council uh, on the, I uh, apologize, on the 20, 20th for prospective action and a, a recommended for approval, uh, as well as the introduction of the city center text amendment and some other items. So looks like we're gonna have a very busy few months. I just, I just noticed on my pile here an additional one that I did not see, uh, or maybe I did. Is Brian, did Brian Doderidge speak? Is he still here? I'm sorry, Brian. Sure, you asked to speak, we're still here. So. Brian Doddridge, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, if allowable, Mr. Sinks, would you, I'll put that site map again. These might be clarifications I need that maybe you need as well, but since you have this continuance to allow for it a little bit more, as far as I could not read all of that. As I look at these buildings, I've toured the Vistagua Church uh, several times now. The public facility is what I would call a sanctuary or worship center. Um, the, the bottom of that, the cone, the, you know, the, uh, up, not the top of it, is what is kind of an open chapel, open air chapel, maybe half the space. Um, uh, right now, it's how it's used. And then I guess to the right, where it says neighborhood commercial, is this what has been referred to um, as the children's building or, or the offices before? Is that the building on the on what I would consider the east? In the future, but right now they exist not as a church office, but as the children's building. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, so the offices, I think the church uses now are part of the worship center, or maybe where the rectory is. Uh, it was kind of a combination of potential housing or church offices. So that is a large space that's not being used for church offices. It would be used for future offices, uh, but that does mean the current sanctuary, uh, if Visago is going to continue to worship there for five years, does not have any space for children's or anything outside of just pure assembly room for adults or children perhaps in the room, but it's just assembly, no childcare rooms. Uh, whereas the building on the east that it will be rezoned, that is 
primarily children's rooms with some open spaces for large group, as I understand it. So while I appreciate the compromises that they have attempted to make uh, the applicant uh, for the church, I don't know how well it will thrive with just uh, just the sanctuary because that would be limited to it beyond the time commitment of just Sundays from whatever time you negotiate. So I think for a church to thrive there, uh, whether it be this one or future ones you talked about, or maybe not none exi exist, uh, to not ha to have very limited space to do that. Um, I don't know there's any space in the current sanctuary that will remain public facility that would allow for any kind of breakout uh, room. There are, there are two large spaces in a conference room, uh, best I can tell, remember with a restroom, uh, one men's restroom. So I just wanna make that point. So that may be semantics, but I do think it's my whole career, I've worried about building churches both uh, literally, physically, and um, uh, figuratively. And I think for an order church to thrive, to fulfill the, the essence of a church spiritually, there would need to be more space than just what's allowed. And then there was language that was passed through, maybe I didn't see in the packet, maybe I missed it, talking about in perpetuity, into perpetuity, Vestago, Epicentro, or church. Did I, did, I, did I catch that that phrase in there? If so, I think it was blocked out by the Zoom thing, so I couldn't read it all. Does that ring a bell on what that was? That it would remain a church into perpetuity or some other? Is that? If the, if the chairs would advise if staff can comment on that. I'll go to the chair. Yeah, if, if you can comment quickly, because technically I, you know, I got off track. Okay, so very good. we need to kind of rein it I, in, but I, go ahead. I can address, when the term perpetuity is used in other materials, it was that the, the building, the chapel, and the assembly hall could be, as a building or a structure, be preserved in perpetuity. But whether it's the Vestago congregation for five years or any other church, that's really up to them whether they continue operations. And furthermore, you're, you did comment on the viability of it. The senior pastor submitted a letter yesterday regarding the viability of their congregation there, and it's on file at the city if you'd like to review it. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, with, with that, through staff reports, can we get a motion to adjourn? Got a motion to adjourn and a second. All those in favor of adjourning say aye. Aye. There are no opposed. And we can all go home. So. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>